2020 to 2024. This is a very, not exactly equivalent, but there is no exact equivalence in technical analysis here. I just wanted to show you this and then compare it uh, to the CPI when I came up with something pretty fascinating. So we have here the triple top. Here is the 1974 equivalent. Here is the later 1974 equivalent. And here is the, Janu the November 1978 equivalent um, at $30. Same triple top. Now, usually in triple tops, if the triple top holds, you have a, a collapse in asset price. I do not think that's going to happen now. I think we're going to break through that triple top just like we did in only 1979. Um, now note here, the top at $30. And note back there, the top at 6.5, at $6.50. Today, we have a fascinating analysis from Rafi Faber, who delves deep into the world of silver and mining stocks. If you're interested in precious metals, market trends, and the broader economic impacts, you're in the right place. In this video, we'll see Rafi Farber's insights on silver's historical trends, its current market behavior, and potential future movements, along with a look at the role of mining stocks and global economic factors. Stay tuned till the end for a comprehensive understanding of these complex but crucial topics. Rafi Farber starts by comparing silver price movements from the 1970s to the present day. He highlights a striking similarity between the two periods, focusing on a technical chart that shows a triple top pattern in silver prices. In the 1970s, silver experienced three significant peaks at around $1.650. The first peak was in January 1974, followed by another in May 1974, and finally a third in November 1978. This pattern is remarkably similar to recent price movements, with significant peaks in August 2020, February 2021, and potentially now. Faber explains that in technical analysis, a triple top pattern usually precedes a significant decline in asset prices. However, he predicts a different outcome this time, suggesting that silver is likely to break through the current resistance level, much like it did in early 1979. This breakthrough could lead to a substantial rise in silver prices, similar to the surge that took silver to $1.50 per ounce by 1980. Faber draws a fascinating parallel between the price ratios of silver in the 1970s and today. The ratio of the 1970s peak $1.650 to today's peak $1.30 is approximately 462. He compares this to the consumer price index CPI ratios from the same periods. In November 1978, the CPI was 67.4, whereas today it stands at 312.33. The ratio of these CPI values is 463 almost identical to the silver price ratio. This striking correlation suggests that silver's historical price movements may be closely tied to inflationary trends. Based on this analysis, Faber predicts that if silver follows a similar trajectory as it did in the 1970s, we could see prices reaching as high as $231 per ounce, assuming no further monetary intervention by the Federal Reserve. However, given the Fed's propensity to print more money, this target could potentially be even higher. Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more expert insights and analysis. This is the Silver Report, uh, of course, and I saw something pretty exciting going on in the technical action here. I've shown this chart before. I wanted to get through it through another angle here. This is not a contiguous chart. You see here on the left side, you have January 1974. On the right side, you have January 1978. So there is a gap here that I'm not showing, but I wanted to zoom in and show the, uh, the triple top here that happened in the 1970s and compared to what's happening now. Uh, so we see here in 1974, silver had a parabolic top of $6.50. We repeated very closely that top here in May of 1974. So this is the equivalent of uh, August 2020 and then February 2021 silver squeeze top where we uh, get, got very close to the, the second top here. And finally in 1978, January 1978, four years later, Four and a half years later, actually, because this is February and this is November, uh, almost five years later, uh, we had a, the final triple top at six dollars and fifty cents, almost exactly. Um, it's it's a very near perfect chart here, and now I want to show you what's going on today. So we have 2020 to 2024. This is a very not exactly equivalent, but there is no exact equivalence in technical analysis here. I just wanted to show you this and then compare it uh, to the CPI when I came up with something pretty fascinating. So we have here the triple top. Here is the 1974 equivalent. Here is the later 1974 equivalent. And here is the, Janu the November 1978 equivalent 
um, at $30. Same triple top. Now, usually in triple tops, if the triple top holds, you have a, a collapse in asset price. I do not think that's going to happen now. I think we're going to break through that triple top just like we did in only 1979. Um, now, note here, the top at $30. And note back there, the top at 6.5, at $6.50. Now, what does that remind you of? Here, I did the math. So we have $6.50 top in the 1970s versus a $30 top now in silver. Sound familiar? Indeed, it does. Because if we take... $30 divided by six and a half dollars, $6.50. I don't know why I keep saying that. The ratio is 4.62. And now I know that the CPI is bull. I get it. But it doesn't mean that it's completely invalid. There is some information being relayed in the CPI. Interestingly here, we have the CPI of November 1978. When that triple top was hit was 67.4. And the CPI now, if you look over here, in this red box, 312.332. Now you take 312.33 divided by 67.4, you have the ratio of the increase in the CPI factor. That's 4.63. Same number, almost exact same number as the difference in the ratio of the silver top, $30 now, $6.5 then, 4.62. Now, if silver had a top of $50 in 1980, just after it broke through this triple top, about a year after it broke the triple top at 6.5, then $50 times the multiple of 4.62 would be a top of $231, assuming the Fed doesn't print any more money at all. Of course it will. So if we're looking for $50 silver, we're looking for a $231 top. And it is looking very much like we are in the late 1970s, uh, close to 1979 now in silver. And silver is just starting now to get moving once we hit 30 and rise above it we will be in space who knows how high we can get and the panic should be very soon after that uh in real money terms uh the last thing i wanted to show is that we have what looks like an imminent miners breakout uh in mining stocks and of course fsm fortuna silver mines is participating in this this is the triangle trend line from 2011, the all-time high in mining stocks. This is the Huey Gold Bugs, Gold Bugs Index. I'm going to show two indices here. Uh, we have the top here in September 2011 at about 570. We have here a trend line established in 2020, hit again in 2022, and we're uh, uh, just below it here. We're at this resistance over here uh, at uh, about, what is it, 270 or whatever it is. And uh, miners did very well yesterday. So once we break through this resistance, we have to break through this triangle trend line. And then we should be off to the races going back to 2012, uh, where this precipitous collapse began a humongous bear market, uh, which we are still struggling to get out of if you're counting it by uh, old highs. Zoom in here how close we are to this triangle. This is the same triangle zooming in from 2020 on a five year chart. So we have here a touch, here a touch. And uh, here we're just pinned below this resistance. We're going to break through it uh, maybe in the next few days, maybe in the next few weeks, but pretty soon. And once we hit something around 290, we should be out of this triangle formation and off to the races. Uh, GDX is even closer. And I think GDX is a little bit more valid than the Huey because you can't really buy the Huey. It's just an index. The GDX is actually an ETF that people buy and sell. So I would say it's slightly more accurate when it's reflective of buyer conditions or seller conditions, market conditions, basically. Uh, so we have the top here in 2011 in the GDX and a touch here, a touch here. And we're very, very close. The triangle trend line looks to be at around 36 or so, and we could break through that any day. Uh, we'll see what happens. If we zoom in, uh, yeah, it's about 36, just above 36 here, and the further we go out, the lower it will be. So I'd say once we break through 36, we are through this triangle and off to the races on miners, and we go into a situation where miners are leading the metals instead of following them reluctantly higher, which has been the case uh, since I think the 2011 top, basically, uh, more or less. There were instances where miners would lead, but they weren't sustained. I think now it will be sustained as we enter into uh, a monetary financial crisis that could be triggered by Asia and the yen. Who knows what's going to happen in the banking system in the next few weeks and months. Stay put. I do believe we are very close to January 1979 when the previous triple top was broken out in silver and then we headed within a year to $50. This could happen very quickly and then we've been waiting for the beginning of it for many, many years. It is, I believe, 
imminent in the next few months. Faber emphasizes the importance of the current $1.30 resistance level in silver prices. He believes that once silver breaks through this level, it could enter a rapid ascent, similar to the late 1970s. This potential breakout is supported by strong technical indicators and a favorable macroeconomic environment for precious metals. Turning to mining stocks, Faber discusses the imminent breakout in the mining sector. He highlights the performance of the Huey Gold Bugs Index and the GDXF, which tracks mining stocks. Both indices show signs of breaking through long-term resistance levels, indicating a potential bull market for mining stocks. Faber explains that the Huey Index has been struggling since its peak in 2011, but it is now approaching a critical resistance level. Similarly, the GDXF is nearing a key resistance point at around $1.36. Once these levels are breached, mining stocks could see significant gains, potentially leading the broader metals market higher. The yen is not just weak against the dollar, it is weak against every Asian currency. The reason I focus on the yen so much is that it is a keystone of the entire global Keynesian system, which was set up between the United States and Japan after World War II, after Bretton Woods, uh, and the Japanese became the most dedicated money printers and debt accumulators in the world relative to their economy. It's about like 265% or some insane number like that. So you can see all of the Asian, not all the Asian currencies, but the major Asian currencies, the major trading partners of Japan in the Asian area. You can see it's at uh, all-time lows relative to all a lot of these currencies you have here, the Chinese yuan, the Korean won, the Thai bot and the Philippine peso, uh, when you have the uh, Japanese currency at a low relative to all these other currencies, it really pressures the other economies uh, to embark on competitive devaluations because it disturbs their trade balances and then they get upset. And when you have competitive devaluations in an environment where consumer prices are already rising in all of these countries pretty fast, uh, you have the, the recipe for really dying currencies and Japan's currency is going to get a lot weaker pretty quickly and you'll see why in a second. Um, so you have here, this is uh, snippets of an article from Bloomberg. Uh, this is not the title of the article, but I wanted to show here how uh, Bloomberg is contradicting itself. Uh, so you have an idea of the dishonesty in financial reporting and I'll follow this with some honesty so you can get some sense for what to look for here. So we have Asian financial crisis from competitive devaluation. This is Bloomberg writing about this. Suspected intervention to drag the yen off a 34-year low against the dollar is already seen as unlikely to have a lasting effect if Japan continues alone, raising this prospect of another bout of weakness in the beleaguered currency. That could push competitive tensions with exporting neighbors South Korea and Taiwan to a peak and heat pressure on China where chatter is already growing about the potential for a yuan devaluation. So yeah, we're headed towards yuan devaluation. The point I wanted to emphasize in this article is that they're saying that Japan, the yen is going to continue to weaken. There's not much that the Bank of Japan can do. But here, later in the article, this is not the next paragraph, this is lower in the article, it says, to be sure there are signs that Japanese authorities may not allow the country's currency to slump further. So you have a complete contradiction between the first paragraph and that later paragraph. The reason I'm putting them back to back here is to show you the open contradiction here, which is not in the article, it just confuses you in the article. Uh, it says here, after falling below the psychological milestone of 160 per dollar for the first time over three decades last week, two rounds of suspected official intervention have helped it stabilize at around the 155 level. I noted in the Endgame Investor on Substack that the uh, Bank of Japan spent about $60 billion pushing the yen higher from 160 to 155 per dollar. And they did this by basically selling their dollar cash they have on their balance sheet and buying yen with it. That's basically all they do. They exist to buy yen and sell yen and manipulate currencies. That's why they exist. So on the one hand, the Bank of Japan can do nothing. On the other hand, they may not allow the Japanese yen to fall below 160. And here it says in this paragraph, a yen slump to the 170 to 180 per dollar level could not only cause problems for Asia, but also impact emerging market currencies more broadly. That's in large part due to the yen's role as a funding currency for carry traders who borrow where rates are low and invest in developing nations where they are high. And the final quote here um, is important because we are in an environment where it's hard to see why treasuries would rally, but here is the reason why they would briefly rally in a little bit of an earthquake out of Asia. It says here, if Asian currencies devalue because of the strong dollar, the funds that invest in local markets will have to pull out. He said the whole 
EM market will crash and that's going to cause a risk off event where treasuries will rally and equities will sell off. This again contradicts what it said earlier in the article that a financial crisis will not repeat itself in Asia. There's going to be no not repeat of 1998, but here it says the whole EM market will crash. Another contradiction, these mar articles make absolutely no sense and they just kind of spit fire different positions at you, but don't weigh them and they're just kind of like put together by AI it seems. Um, okay, so here I wanted to go into an instance of actual journalistic integrity of Axios versus CNBC. So this on the right is CNBC talking about the deal in FTX, the crypto exchange that went kaput um, a few months ago. Uh, was it a year ago already? I don't remember. Uh, so it says here, FTX says most customers of the bankrupt crypto exchange will get all their money back. That sounds great. Faber also touches on the broader economic factors influencing silver and mining stocks. He points to the weakening Japanese yen and its impact on global currencies. The yen's decline pressures other Asian currencies to devalue, potentially leading to competitive devaluations and further currency instability. This instability could trigger a flight to safety among investors, driving up demand for precious metals like silver and gold. Faber highlights the importance of monitoring the yen's performance and its potential to cause a ripple effect across global markets. Faber concludes with a critical look at financial reporting, using recent coverage of FTX's bankruptcy as an example. He contrasts the optimistic reporting by CNBC, which suggests that FTX customers will recover their funds, with the more realistic analysis by Axios. The latter points out that while customers might get back their dollar value, they will not recover the appreciation of their assets, effectively resulting in a significant loss. This example underscores the importance of critical thinking and due diligence in financial analysis. Faber urges viewers to be wary of contradictory reports and to seek out reliable sources of information. So it begins by saying this, almost all customers of collapsed cryptocurrency exchange FTX will get their money back and more, according to a court filing. Well, that's, that's wonderful. And then it gives you a, a, a sum of the cash they have on hand, um, about $11.2 billion. That's amazing. So customers will get $50,000. Uh, with with $50,000 or less, will receive 118%. Keeps going going on how great this deal is. And then later in the article, this is later, it's not immediately after this, it says, accordingly, the debtors have not been able to benefit from the appreciation of these missing tokens during the Chapter 11 cases. So basically, that means that they will get the dollar amount that they had in their account when their uh, cryptocurrencies were stolen by Sam Bankman Freed and company, but they will not get the appreciation that would have accrued had they still had that Bitcoin. But it only says this in quoting a press release and wants to emphasize how great the deal is where they're getting their, their dollars back, but not their assets back that were stolen from them. But here, Axios is actually a lot more honest and emphasizes what you need to know here. So it says FTX plans to repay customers in full quotation marks. Here's why they still lose. So it says here in the first sentence, FTX took a significant step in its bankruptcy case filing reorganization plan that touts to repay customers in full plus interest. Why it matters? Customers still don't stand to recover what they lost in the cryptocurrency collapse. Between the lines, bankruptcy lawyers for FTX announced a plan Tuesday night in which customers with $50,000 or less were the assets on the platform, uh, which is about 98% of users, would get 180% of the value of their assets. But if someone had a Bitcoin and FTX at that time, it was worth 18,562 and now it's worth, what is it, $62,000. So uh, the recovery plan is uh, about equivalent to a Bitcoin price of $21,903. Um, they're losing about, uh, they're getting about 33% uh, on the dollar or on the Bitcoin. So uh, you have perfect example here of honest reporting by Axios versus dishonest reporting by CNBC. If there is honesty anywhere in the mainstream media, that's a good sign. I don't know if it's a trend. I don't know if this is just uh, crypto uh, enthusiasts uh, being honest uh, because they're enthusiastic about crypto or whatever it is.